I think Meghan and Harry will absolutely celebrate behind closed doors. I think that they've made it incredibly clear that what they want right now is the opportunity to settle into their new life in LA quietly and privately and to kind of get Archie settled in. You have to keep in mind that moving A, from one country to another and then kind of from moving from one side of the country to another, that's a lot to be doing with a baby boy who is but one year old. I think that any parents out there can empathize with the two of them going through all of that, especially the fact that they're doing it amid a global pandemic. That's a lot to kind of take on as parents. Now, if their engagement is any indication of how they like to celebrate things, I think it will be very quiet. I think it will be very private. And I think that the two of them will just enjoy the fact that they do have that privacy afforded to them now. For those who don't remember, the two of them got engaged while they were living together at Kensington Palace in Harry's kind of small cottage on the grounds. And Meghan said that the two of them were just roasting a chicken that evening, that it was a very quiet, very private, intimate moment, and that that made it all the more meaningful to her. So I think that their anniversary celebrations will likely take a very similar route. But again, the fact that they haven't had the opportunity to throw a big party for Archie's birthday because of the pandemic may well mean that they kind of throw three celebrations into one and they do a kind of moving party, a birthday party and an anniversary party all at once, just as an opportunity to kind of spend time with their friends and celebrate their arrival in LA, while also giving Archie the chance to kind of celebrate his birthday with some of his parents' best friends. Prince Harry, and his love life had been the source of speculation for years. He'd had a number of girlfriends. A lot of people thought that he was going to marry Chelsea Davy, myself included. And I think that when he got engaged to someone who hadn't really been on the royal scene, it just sent interest and speculation through the roof. Everyone was fascinated by Meghan and Harry, how they met, what they had in common, how did a member of the royal family kind of get involved in a relationship with an American actress? What on earth is going on? And that just continued to build and build throughout their romance. And when they announced that they were engaged, again, it took another step up and people were just fascinated by the whole thing. First of all, Prince Harry is a beloved figure in the UK. People really do feel a huge sense of connection and attachment both to Harry and his brother. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that most members of the British public remember them as being those two young boys who did walk behind their mother's coffin at her funeral. And as a result, everyone kind of has a little bit of a stronger emotional connection to the two of them. So when Harry walked down the aisle, I have no doubt that there were thousands, if not millions of people shedding a kind of proud tear for him and also just feeling really happy and overjoyed that he had kind of finally found the person that he wanted to spend the rest of his life with. Plus, there's also other things to take into account. For example, her dress design, who was going to design it? There was so much speculation about who she had chosen to create that stunning gown. And in the end, she made two designers design dresses for her, which made it all the more exciting. One for the wedding ceremony and one for the reception which meant that people got double the fashion action. And that was, again, another really exciting moment. The dress was designed by Claire Waite Keller. It was a Givenchy design. Now, the dress was absolutely beautiful. It was very simple, but very elegantly cut. Megan really did kind of show that she wanted to pay mind to more royal fashion traditions. Now, before she got married, she kind of really enjoyed living that kind of non-royal lifestyle a little bit. We'd seen her in jeans, we'd seen her in kind of cool sneakers, things that we weren't necessarily used to seeing members of the royal family wearing. So there was a lot of speculation that the dress would be very funky, very kind of out there. There might be a one shoulder situation, but she really did kind of stick with something very traditional, very regal, and she looked absolutely beautiful. She also paid tribute to the country that she was living in, to the monarchy that she was marrying into with the veil, which had hand embroidered flowers to represent all of the different countries in the Commonwealth. So that was a really touching moment that 
didn't necessarily get a huge amount of fanfare on the day because it was very subtly done. But afterwards, when people spoke about the dress design, when it was revealed that that's what Megan had done, I think it was quite meaningful to a lot of people, particularly those members of the British public who had maybe been, you know, a little bit kind of worried about what it meant to have someone who wasn't born in the UK marrying into the royal family. Claire Wake Keller posted a few images from the wedding on her Instagram account to mark the two year anniversary of the royal couple getting hitched. And she also spoke very personally about what it meant to her to design Meghan's wedding dress. Now, she made it very clear that the process was very personal for both women. Now, we already know that the two of them formed a very close friendship both before the wedding and also during this design process. She explained that purity and simplicity were the kind of guiding principles when it came to creating the gown, that they were incredibly eager to pay tribute to the Commonwealth countries in a very kind of elegant and subtle way. And I think that they did a really wonderful job of doing that. Claire also made it clear that Meghan had a very big hand in the design of her wedding dress. She said that they kind of spent hours discussing exactly what it would look like, how it would fit, what materials would be used and things like that. And I think that Meghan has always been someone who's shown a very keen interest in fashion. And this was probably an incredibly personal and emotional project for her to be able to kind of work with someone on such an intimate level in order to create what ended up being the perfect wedding dress. The moment that stuck out most at the wedding was when Meghan walked up the aisle, saw Harry and he told her how beautiful she looked. I think that that was a moment that really struck everyone as being a true indication of just how in love the two of them were and are. I think that you know, it was one of those very quiet, very special moments that not a lot of people picked up on. In fact, it wasn't until after the video of their wedding had been played over and over and over again and lip readers had seen it and decide, deciphered what he said that people even really knew it had happened. But it was a really great show of intimacy between the two of them. It was a very private moment at the altar before they tied the knot. And I think that that is the moment that really kind of sticks in my mind as being a really kind of emotional and special one. Now, there were so many brilliant moments during that wedding. I also loved the fact that they kind of, again, did things in their own way. Who can forget Harry driving that sports car with Meghan in that new dress. She put on a Stella McCartney design kind of for the reception. The two of them roared off in that convertible Jag which I believe was actually an electric car. It really was a great mix of royal tradition with a bit of Hollywood glamour. The two of them did a great job of kind of merging those two different worlds. And I think that that's really wonderful. I also think that Meghan choosing to walk down the aisle with Prince Charles was a really special moment. You know, it showed that she really did want to get Harry's family involved in the ceremony, that she wanted them to feel as though they were a big part of her life. And, you know, she kind of, again, did a great job of mixing and matching kind of her traditions with royal tradition. She walked down the first half of the church by herself, was then met by Prince Charles, who escorted her the rest of the way. And I think that that's a really great opportunity for her to kind of show that she is an independent, boss woman but at the same time she also prides herself in terms of kind of respecting family and also showing Harry and his relatives that they mean a great deal to her. Megan and Harry as I said did a really great job of kind of melding their backgrounds as it were. They had a lot of kind of royal touches um, involved in the ceremony but they also had a number of things that kind of came from Megan's childhood and Megan's background. They had a gospel choir performing, which was absolutely incredible. They also had a minister from Chicago who came in to kind of speak at the service. And I think that these are all touches that kind of indicated the fact that the two of them were really coming from completely different worlds, but making it work both as a couple and also as wedding planners. The whole thing was absolutely wonderful. The ceremony was beautiful. 
And I think that it was a really great opportunity for the two of them to bring together all of their favorite nearest and dearest people and kind of show off their personalities a little bit. Obviously, we saw a lot of Hollywood A-listers attending the wedding too, which, you know, we've had a couple of those at royal weddings in the past, but never before has a royal wedding kind of looked like a royal carpet. I don't think Oprah has ever attended a royal wedding. We also had a lot of cast members from Suits, which Megan was obviously the star of a few years ago. So it really was a kind of very different approach to doing things. They also chose, and this is something that I think kind of was maybe a bit disappointing to the British public. They also chose not to do that famous balcony kiss. Now, William and Kate actually did it twice. They kissed twice when they stepped out on the balcony at Buckingham Palace to kind of wave to their adoring public. And William and Kate's balcony kiss was made even more hilarious by the fact that one of the flower girls was seen putting her hands over her ears and making a horrified face at all of the noise. That's become a moment that really is a kind of slice of history for every royal wedding. So Harry and Meghan's decision not to do that was a bit disappointing to the public, but I think we can absolutely say that we got more than enough photo moments from the two of them throughout their wedding day. And I think that at the end of the day, the British public walked away feeling as though they had really had a great glimpse at the wedding and, and at the kind of ceremony and things like that. And the overall feeling wasn't one of disappointment. It was one of excitement and kind of happiness for the newlywed couple. The reception was a <laughs> hoot. Uh, several people who were in attendance have come out and said that it got pretty wild and rowdy. Uh, James Corden, who obviously is British, but now broadcasts on a TV show here in the US, he kind of made a joke on the Late Late Show about the fact that someone got incredibly drunk. Now, he wouldn't let slip the name of that person, but he did kind of admit that it got a little bit raucous at times. George and Amal are very close friends of Harry and Meghan to the point where there were a lot of rumors going around in, in the kind of months leading up to Archie's birth that they may well be godparents. Uh, Amal attended Meghan's baby shower and they actually provided the private jet that Meghan used to get back from her New York baby shower to London. So they have an incredibly close connection. And I think that when this kind of reception happened, it took place behind closed doors. You have to keep in mind that getting married in front of millions of people around the world, knowing that your ceremony is being broadcast on television, let alone doing it in front of the hundreds of people that are in the church with you, that's a nerve wracking experience, okay? That's something that I don't think anyone will really ever have to go through unless you happen to marry into the royal family. And I think that when they finally got to the reception, when they had done that kind of drive in the Jaguar, they'd done their final photo call of the day, I think there really was a feeling of relief and also a final feeling that they could just relax and enjoy themselves and let loose, knowing that they were only around people that they trusted and loved and that they didn't need to worry about what was captured on camera, what someone might say. It was kind of, the reception was really the one moment, the one aspect of the wedding that the public had no hand in. Now we've obviously heard tidbits of this and that kind of after it, but no one really knows what went on behind closed doors because they wanted it to be that way. They wanted at least one part of their wedding to be just for them and their nearest and dearest. 